Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of the Theoretical Biophysicist podcast. Uh, today, I am joined by Adam and Max, two researchers from uh, the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Uh, thank you guys for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. So let's just kind of dive right on in then. The title of the paper is Survival and Branching Cellular Populations. What got you guys interested in this? Well, I guess uh, I can start a little bit. So, so I've uh, been thinking uh, a long time about how the shape of populations influences um, their evolution and dynamics. So if you have strains within a population, how do they compete and divide and so on? And how does that depend on the actual shape of the population, whether it's population of cells growing in a spherical clump or a kind of disk of cells uh, spreading on the surface of a petri dish as you might have in a microbial experiment. And there was this very interesting paper that came out in 2017, I think, uh, from the Simons group at Cambridge that showed that branching tissues, uh, such as uh, ducts and kidneys and mammary glands, um, that their properties are described very well by a very simple geometrical model of uh, branching and annihilating random walkers. And so I thought that would be a great sort of playground for understanding how geometry influences uh, evolution. So that's, that's what, uh, originally got me sort of started. It kind of fit naturally in my previous uh, work. And there was this exciting new result about the geometry of uh, branching populations. And uh, yeah, sort of went from there. I guess Adam yeah. can say how, how you got interested in that. Yeah, yeah. So I had, I had uh, in that 2017-2018 uh, period, I had uh, Dr. Max here for thermal physics, thought he was a Cool professor started going, sitting in on some research meetings with some graduate students as a uh, sophomore. And over the summer, that just turned into uh, that. I uh, went to Dr. Max's office, said, hey, I'd like to do some research. And he said, cool, I've got this uh, interesting problem we can look at. And it turned into the next three summers, plus a little uh, tacked on the end there of researching this problem. Yeah, I mean, it seems like professors are always happy to have, you know, kind of <laughs> cheap and free labor come around. But in some sense, it seems like, you know, studying kind of this random walking, branching patterns, it seems almost you could look at this out across multiple scales. Like when you were talking about growing cells on a petri dish and kind of reaching some boundary, I, you know, I came to the thinking of, you know, people growing across a country and reaching kind of, you know, the, the water's edge. So it seems like you could also kind of apply this model across a whole variety of scales. So it's really kind of hearkening deep. Um, I have a lot of fundamental physics because I noticed you mentioned random walkers in this. So how do you kind of build random walking into kind of a more growth type model? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say there, there's multiple random walks going on. There's a kind of diffusive random walk process occurring within the population, that's the competition. And then there's also the actual motion of the branches, which in the Simons paper, they sort of demonstrated that uh, branching tissue like these kidney ducts and mammary glands to a good approximation, individual branches as they grow, they'll sort of undulate and uh, move around a little bit. So, and that's described well by a persistent random walk, which is a random walk that prefers to continue on in the same sort of direction it was going before. So it's got some persistence because of these sort of elastic properties of the branches. They, they tend to be stiff and difficult to, uh, to bend you know, on some length scale. But uh, overall, if you observe a branch growing, um, it'll eventually reorient and effectively perform a random walk on a large enough length scale of observation. So, so there's, yeah, there's two different, there, there's lots of different kinds of random walkers in this problem. 
makes it kind of interesting. A whole lot of randomness. Yeah, so I guess we can maybe talk a little bit more about this undulation. So you kind of have branches that are growing up through time, and you also have them kind of moving about in space. Do you want to describe what happens if you see two branches that get close to one another, or, you know, what happens in that case? Yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, this is, this, this part of the model is, again, um, it's from, from the Simon's work uh, in 2017. They showed that to a good approximation, basically what happens in these ducts. And this is also kind of observed in other branching populations like um, swarming colonies of uh, microbes. They can also form these branch structures. And what happens is when a branch end gets close to uh, another branch, like the uh, stalk, I guess, uh, of another branch, it typically just stops growing because there's a variety of reasons. There might be some signaling mechanism uh, in the case of sort of complex branching tissue. In the case of something like a microbe, well, they uh, form these branches due to kind of nutrient limited uh, growth. They basically receive enough nutrients to grow at the tips. And if one of these tips gets close to another branch in that region, competition not, for food. Yeah. Yeah. It'll not have enough uh, nutrients to continue. So we don't growing. have any type of fusion going on where two branches kind of merge together and make a quote unquote super branch. Uh, not, not in our model, although I suppose, yeah, that is a possibility. Okay, interesting then. So, you know, we mentioned a little bit, we, um, or you have these branches kind of growing in space and you wanna introduce some type of mutant into them. What exactly does this mutant kind of represent? Yeah, so in these cellular populations, uh, you can think about just identifying a single cell, right? And you can ask well, what happens to the progeny of that cell as those, as it, you know, the structure evolves in time. So you pick a cell, any cell, and you ask what, what, what does its lineage do? How does it spread through the population? How do the daughter cells and the daughters of the daughters, how do they spread? And so that's why we kind of identify strains which could represent just the progeny of any particular cell. Now, we also look at the case when the single cell does have a kind of a special property that it grows a little bit faster than uh, the other cells that surround it in the population. And that could represent something like uh, perhaps if your branching population is really an invasion of an existing branching structure, like a, a cancerous invasion of a, a system of ducts in an organ. Yeah, more rapid division cancerous cells, right? Yeah, so some of those, the, the cancerous population will be heterogeneous and will have a wide distribution of different growth rates for the cancer cells. And some of them might be very fast growing cells. And so you might ask, how do the fast growing cells kind of spread uh, along the structure? How do they invade it? What is the probability that they kind of sweep the population and become the dominant strain? within the population. So that's that's the idea of um, picking a particular quote unquote strain and observing it as uh, the population evolves. So it seems in like kind of the crux of the paper is, okay, I introduced this mutation or a mutant into the system and I wanna see how it kind of proliferates through. So what kind of popped out about this and what parameters could you kind of tune to impact whether or not this mutant actually survived? Um, so the, the biggest, uh, the biggest parameter that you, uh, that, that affects this is just how, uh, you can think of this as like how rapidly or aggressively the, uh, the cell grows. And you'll say maybe, you know, maybe, um, our mutant strain is 10% more likely to, um, 
uh, to lineage than a native strain. And what you find is that just small, small tunings of that parameter, it was very easy to go from, if they're totally neutral, you know, you're looking at a one versus 99, 100, whatever scenario, where you have almost no survival. You tune that up a little bit and it's almost guaranteed. And uh, then the interesting thing is when you uh, add the branching uh, structures themselves that these grow on, is um, is you'll find that if struck if if it's not just a single stalk and you do get these branches that uh, that divide and bifurcate out and out, um, that that seems to really increase the uh, chance chance uh, that your mutant strain is going to survive at long periods of time, with the exception that you can have too rapid of growth. If growth is too rapid, then all of these tips coming out at the same time will just start running into each other. And then you can get the entire structure dies, or it's just more, it's just, there's a huge ratio of branches that are dying to branches that are born. So even if, uh, you know, even if this strain has taken over, if you will, uh, three, four, 10 branches, um, if they all annihilate then you have no mutant cell because they've they've not proliferated out to the out to the uh, frontier so that's I, I have two things i guess i want to ask about this because this is interesting but going back to the first one where you mentioned that if you have kind of a equivalent type mutant so it has no real selective advantage you see kind of a very sharp transition if you kind of turn it up just a little bit do you have any, um, you know, physical interpretation for why that might be? Uh, so it, it's adding a select. So it, it depends on it, it sort of, it, the actual selective advantages that strains might have uh, within such populations do tend to be quite small, um, the, less than a percent. So, uh, but. Again, the idea is that any selective advantage, right, will um, bias the growth of the mutant and allow it to uh, spread through the population. So the only thing that really, so if you imagine an infinitely sized population where um, essentially the cells, what, what, what can happen to the strain? Either it can maintain an equal fraction inside the population. So if you had one-tenth of the population occupied by this mutant strain, then it remains one-tenth in an sort of infinitely sized population. That, that's, that would be the neutral case, right? And if you add any kind of selective advantage, of course, in an infinite population, the, uh, the strain would just spread and take over completely um, after a while because it'll have a larger growth rate than all of the other cells. And so eventually it'll just uh, take over. Yeah, I so guess it's, you, uh, oh, I was gonna say, yeah, if you have yeah. like some kind of exponential growth and you put a factor that's just a little bit bigger in there, it's gonna shoot up a lot, lot faster. Yeah, exactly, uh, the this, that's, the, that's the principle. So in fact, it's harder for a cell in a finite size population that even if it has a selective advantage to take over because the selective advantage isn't enough, the cell also has to overcome um, what's called genetic drift, which is small number fluctuations. The fact that you don't actually have some fraction of the population, uh, you know, you have a finite population, so you have something like, I have two out of 10 cells that are the mutant. Well then, um, you really need those two particular cells to survive over multiple generations and mm -hmm. um, generate enough progeny to sort of take over the entire population. And so that's, uh, there will be fluctuations because of individual sort of cell birth and death that might prevent that from happening. So you can have- Yeah, I mean, you can't exactly go have a, uh, I mean, I was gonna say, you know, like it wouldn't do you much good if you were to try and have, you know, create a Captain America and then he gets just hit by a bus as soon as he walks outside <laughs> yes. and like proliferate mm -hmm. on. Yeah, I guess that, that's right. Also, I, I thought it was interesting you mentioned um, the fact that if you grow too quickly, even if you have a lot of mutants, it eventually dies out. Does this kind of, you know, give some 
undertone, you know, you don't want to kind of have like a, um, a flash fire in some sense, you know, you burn way too hot too fast. Well, it's interesting. There are different kinds of uh, growth going on. So there's the actual growth of the branching population. And then there's the competition between cell types within uh, each branch. And so um, what Adam was referring to is the fact that if the entire population uh, grows too quickly in the sense that it branches um, very quickly, then uh, since we have this rule that the branch tips can't get close to any existing branches, then what will happen is if your branching rate is too fast, you'll get a bunch of sort of short stubby branches because they'll all kind of run into each other. So you get this kind of cauliflower type uh, patterning. And so, yeah, in that case, uh, it's actually diff very difficult for strains to survive on such structures because if you're in any given branch, the chances are that that branch will just collide with another branch and uh, the population will, will go extinct on that branch. So that's, that's the idea there. Interesting. Did you guys find any other type of, you know, interesting limits where you could see kind of mutants proliferating forward more or less, depending on the parameters of the system? Yeah, it appears that there's really this delicate balance between um, the branch termination and the branch um, bifurcation. So if you think about a single branch that splits into two, that helps strains because the overall population doubles along that branch. And that, that kind of creates an, an inflationary effect, which um, enhances uh, survival probability because it mitigates this genetic drift, right? It sort of increases the total population size. So there's less of a chance that a random fluctuation will uh, cause the extinction of a, of a mutant. And so, that is helped by an increased branching rate. But on the other hand, as we just sort of talked about, a very large branching rate will lead to lots of branch terminations because of this co these collisions, these branch collisions. And so there's a kind of optimal branching rate uh, at which uh, mutants, neutral mutants say, uh, are most likely to survive. And I think that's a kind of intriguing result of the modeling because it suggests that there might be a kind of perhaps a biologically relevant optimum for, for the branching, uh, branching rate, which could be tested um, in various populations to see how far you are, how close you are to this optimal value. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. You guys have a really nice blend of kind of both simulation and theory where you kind of describe this genetic drift equation with what looks to me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, just kind of like a governing diffusion equation. Um, so you have, you know, part PDE and then part um, just simulation results. And you're, and you're able to compare the two and see that in the limiting conditions, if you turn off branch uh, termination or turn off branch um, kind of bifurcations, you wind up getting very different results. So I guess, is there any, um, <laughs> so you have like some nice governing theory for this, and then you also have simulation results too, which you know exactly right. what's going on in the model, but you don't like, you know, you're not, you don't get like a nice clean equation. You just get like some observable. Was there any type of reconciliation between the two that was surprising to you? Well, there are aspects of this model that are difficult to treat analytically. So you mentioned the PDE, and indeed, if you think about just a bifurcating structure, the cellular competition on the individual branches is described with the sort of diffusive PDE. Um, and so that PDE lives in this kind of complex geometry, right? The, domain which you're working with actually bifurcates. And um, so the diffusion equation lives on a while on a single 
ring, which would be the circumference of one branch. And then all of a sudden at the bifurcation point, it'll have to live on uh, two different branches. And I guess what was surprising in the reconciliation is actually the details of that branching process, the particular shape of the bifurcation region, that that didn't really matter too much uh, from the point of view of calculating survival probabilities of strains. It, the, the only thing that mattered is that the population inflated from you know, one branch to two branches. The particular details of the bifurcation seemed to sort of uh, not be relevant, which was very surprising, uh, at least to me. It is sort of consistent with previous work on sort of um, spatially structured populations and survival probabilities. It was shown that sort of survival probability in particular is not too sensitive to the geographic structure of the population. Uh, but it was still sort of surprising to see for these uh, branching structures. So if I understand correctly, then essentially it's the fact that as long as you can not have as much genetic drift, that's what's more important than yes. uh, anything else. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. With, the, with, the small, uh, with the small number fluctuations there, just think uh, in the neutral case, um, half of our structures will immediately just have our mutant strain die, right? If, if you could get to two cells, that becomes a lot harder. You know, it's like, it's like a, I mean, it's like, a, it's like getting a child to the age of like three or five or whatever, you know, if you've got two or three cells, then that's immediately really difficult. And if you split onto two branches, or if all the strain is on one branch, and you've got six cells, you know, for some of the selection biases that we were uh, uh, doing, which really were not that much. If you have six cells out of a hundred on a branch, uh, that we, you know, that's almost guaranteed survival. Yeah, I was going to ask if there's like some type of critical number that you found that, but okay, in that case, is there anything else kind of surprising from the study that you wanted to mention or talk about? Anything maybe difficult? Yeah, so so from sort of the theoretical point of view, I, sort of, I didn't quite finish this. So the PDE that we worked with, we were only able to solve it on a, basically an inflating ring. You, you, you think of a single um, branch, and then we solved it, this problem analytically uh, in the case where you have that branch inflate to an arbitrary size. And that's supposed to represent a, the, the branch bifurcation. So you just assume that basically everything is one big fat branch that just <laughs> grows uh, according to a certain scheme uh, related to the branching rate and so on. But I think a, a really, you know, the right way to do it would be to actually think about the geometry um, of the branching and um, to think about how it actually, how the splitting occurs and what effects that has. So it was surprising that for this particular quantity we looked at that that didn't seem to matter much because our analytic results matched very well with the simulation uh, results for the survival probabilities. But in principle, there, there's probably other quantities such as, um, well, for instance, the distribution of the strains uh, across the different branches. That's something we haven't looked at really and it would be really an interesting next step to see sort of what fraction of this branching population is occupied by a particular lineage. Um, yeah, I mean, it would certainly be interesting to see the spatial breakdown of where things kind of really uh, take off. I also kind of wanted to ask, you talk about this a little bit, but maybe you could speculate some as if you not had, you know, maybe one mutant, but you add in two mutants or three mutants, I mean, in that, in some sense, sometimes you might have cooperation between the mutants so that they both survive or they compete against one another. Do you have any thoughts about what might happen there? Yeah, that's a, a really a fascinating avenue for uh, exploration in this kind of um, system. So uh, I'd say in all of these cases, the uh, genetic drift plays a sort of key role. For instance, if you have cells that require strains that are so-called mutualists that uh, require each other to survive, um, genetic drift kind of harms this uh, 
mutualism because it forces uh, locally uh, the strain to fix to one particular uh, type or another. And so you only have this mutualism occurring at uh, boundaries between uh, cell types, right? If you have a spatially distributed population like on a Petri dish or something, you only have the mutualism kind of localized to particular regions, unlike in a test tube or something where all of the cells are sort of constantly interacting. Yeah, well mixed kind of. Yeah. So I think in a branching structure, yeah, it, it it's, uh, would be interesting to see what happens to the mutualism um, along these branches, which in some sense kind of both mitigates uh, genetic drift, but it, it's really unclear for, I think the maybe the spatial aspects, the actual branch geometry might be more relevant when uh, considering these kinds of interactions, right? Uh, mutualism or antagonism. You might wonder how the actual patches of uh, organisms, what they look like along these branches. Um, and that's also yeah, something I mean, I you could really put kind of some maybe external force or something that's position dependent. So, you know, branching might not spread as quickly to the right as it does to the left. And um, kind of representing in some sense, I'm just thinking back to, you know, people moving, but if there's a big mountain, no one wants to go up the mountain. So they all kind of go back down into the valley in some sense. Yeah, there generally there'll be chemical gradients and things of that nature that could bias the growth of any population or, you know, a, a nutrient gradient. Yeah, pressure gradients, any thermodynamic force could push you towards a particular direction. So I guess kind of my last question then is um, essentially, you know, what kind of keeps you interested in studying topics like these? Uh, so for me, it, it's it's really this, uh, the geometrical aspect is really fascinating to me. Uh, what happens to dynamical processes on, you know, dynamical geometries? Things in general, you know, change shape over time, they grow and uh, develop different curvatures. And that really strongly influences dynamic processes such as cellular evolution. And my group, we also look at pattern formation and how that's influenced by um, curvature and geometry. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of an overarching motivation, I guess, for me is uh, understanding understanding that. Um, geometry, back, back to the, the ninth grade self, right? Adam, how about you? Yeah. I, uh, I really enjoyed the... Um, when we when we first uh, tackled this problem, there was just on just the one stalk. There is an analytic solution that uh, we we simulated enough we can line up with practically perfectly. But um, it I really enjoyed how you start adding seemingly simple things like all right, we're just going to grow to two branches. Or, um, or we're going to have these branches wiggle around a little bit, and you 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 quickly, quickly divorce yourself from analytics. It becomes entirely, almost entirely uh, simulated at that point, because especially when you're moving around in uh, the closest a machine can simulate to 3D space, um, you 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 get off the math, and it just becomes just run it, see what happens. And I, you know, I I quite enjoyed that. We'd have these things running for weeks at a time we'd get a file throw it up in python and say hey look at this that's kind of nice you you see that um you see that region there where we've got our where we've got our you know low survival because you don't branch high survival uh low survival because you branch too much and then that nice region there in the middle you know i thought that was uh i thought that was really quite interesting yeah it's always nice to have some combination of the two so you have something to kind of govern it and then something that you know you can really kind of get your hands on and work with. So uh, do you guys, how do you want people to follow your work? Any web pages, Twitter feeds, stuff like that? Yeah, I have uh, sort of uh, my website, which you could just Google my name and then it just pops up. I think it's maxlevrantovich.com, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll link to uh, yeah. it in the show notes, but 
Uh, any other future work coming out in this area you want people to kind of keep an eye on? Uh, well, this this work is not yet out, so uh, <laughs> we, have, we have we have the preprint, uh, so this is sort of brand new stuff. Uh, but so we're continuing work in this direction for sure. Okay, well, uh, Adam and Dr. Lavrentovich, uh, <laughs> thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for Thank having you. me.